who started me on a spiritual journey also set out to be a concert pianist, Uncle Murray. <clears throat> we lived on a farm, and I think I told you he was moved out of the mental institution to an apartment over the barn after being in this institution for 17 years because he was a mystic. This was in the 40s, actually maybe the 30s. And people didn't understand walking around mystics. And, and so they didn't, you know, when you're different sometimes, um, people don't understand you because you're, you're different. And he was different. And, um, and so we started drinking because that was a way to cope with his emotions. We all have our own ways of dealing with emotions. And, um, and so that, you know, made it really easy to categorize him and put him in a box and then put him in a building and leave him there. And uh, I met him when I was 12 and when he moved back to the farm. And you know, I have pianists in my life, and every time someone is here, like you were today, Rich, playing something, I know this music. I remember my father playing it. I remember Uncle Murray would say, just sit down, and he'd go put something on the piano, on the, the big LP, the big record player, and he'd say, listen to this, and tell me what you think this story is about. And then he'd talk to me about spiritual things. And in his apartment over the barn, he had all the books that we read. He had all the gurus. He had all the history of metaphysics. He had the great Catholic mystics. He had, you know, um, all of the Swedenborg and all of them. This crazy man who lived in an institution because people didn't understand what he understood. But when he played music, you could understand what he understood if you were halfway awake. So I'm grateful for that piece of music. I'm grateful for the name of it. I'm, I'm grateful that you know we're using that piece of music as a way to honor what we know about the endless cycle of life. Because life is eternal. There, who knows about time? We make it up. 
uh, my father played the piano and my mother would whistle. I had, it was all I could do to not whistle along with Rachmaninoff and Rich today. <laughs> but I know that would have seemed a little irreverent, so I didn't do that. <laughs> but I really wanted to. In honor of my mother, who made her transition a year ago tomorrow, and it was really being with my mother before coming here. It's really my mother who got me here. And it, it was actually, no, she's not who got me here. Anita got me here, actually. And, um, but my mother was in the process of hospice and making her transition and having all four of us siblings be in this little apartment last May 20th before I came to do the prac retreat on May 22nd. Um, it was the openness that Rick is now in, that experience of being so open to the life cycle that he is in, that we are in, that Linda knows from working in hospice, and Lynn and, and Jim, there he is now. <laughs> it's when you work with this transition between what we call life and death. You know, it was the most beautiful moment in my life. And it, it gets you so open that you're a different person than you are when you're trying to look good or trying to be what you think they need or you need or they told you to be or whatever. Whatever it is that opens you up, give thanks for that. Because that's where we're meant to live. We're meant to live in the light of that truth. That there is just an eternal energy constantly, constantly flowing through all of it, all of us, to our degree of receptivity. We decide how light to be, how open to be. So, you know, something can be sad and happy at the same time, you know. I am so grateful for all the things in my life that have opened me up, and they haven't all been wonderful. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Haven't you had things that have opened you up that are just like, oh, my God, really? Uh-huh. Oh, good. I'm not alone in here. <laughs> But when you look back on those things, you find that those were the moments that you actually broke out of the shell, or you actually stepped out of the pattern. I wrote a letter recently to a conference that I've been invited to speak at in Oslo in October. And, um, and I said, well, there's something about chaos that is so powerful because it loosens our moorings to the pattern. And, you know, it's a valuable thing if you don't fling yourself off the planet. But they say you can't fall off, so I'm banking on that. <laughs> so today is the last Sunday in spiritual living through accountability. And the topic is aligning our values with our actions. Now, when I read that, I thought it really should be the other way around, isn't it? Aligning our actions with our values. And these topics are given to us. Science of Mind is doing this whole thing where the whole Science of Mind community is invited to explore the same topic every week. You know, not the same topic every week, but all together every week we explore a topic. And the idea is to move the, com the whole Science of Mind community in a level of consciousness and a level of of having our actions match our values, match our beliefs. And that's integrity. When our actions match our values, match our beliefs, then we're in alignment. And that's not an easy thing, necessarily. So when I thought about this title, thinking that maybe it was backwards, I thought, well, actually, it's not. Because there is such a dynamic relationship between values and actions. And sometimes if you want to know what you value, look at what you're doing. Look at your actions. 
Look at how you respond to life. It's very, very easy to see. We can tell. So today we're going to do three things. We're going to ask ourselves the question, what is the truth for me as I know it? We're going to look at a principle, and we're going to look at a practice. And we're going to do that in 20 more minutes. So what is the truth for you? Just ask yourself the question, what is truth for you? So, you know, the truth actually evolves. What was true for me when I was 18 isn't true for me when I'm the age I'm at now. I almost said it out loud. <laughs> actually, I don't care. I'm going to be 70 this year, and I'm really thrilled about that. Because I figure if you can have this much energy at 70, I remember telling my kids when I was 33, I'm going to get really more radical for as long as I can because as I get older, I know I, like, we all tend to get more in the middle. And, I, you know, we go, and so I want to end up in the middle. So I have a lot of energy, and I believe I'm going to live to 100 and beyond and be healthy. So that's my intention. So what is the truth? The truth is whatever we believe it is, is true for us. So here in this teaching, we have several things that we say are true. There's one life, there's one power, one God, one presence. We say that that is true. We call that truth a truth principle, a universal principle. We find that same truth in lots of other teachings. And we say, see, there it is. It's there and it's there and it's there. That axiomatically would make it true, right? If you see it everywhere. But what really makes it true? What do you think? What really makes it true? That's right. How does it show up in your life? That's when you know that it's true. So I don't know about you, but I know that I've had a lot of things that I've thought were true for me but when I looked at how I was showing up, I could see that I might have wanted them to be true, but they weren't true yet. You know, I was in process of having that become true. It was a hope. It was a wish. It was an intention. It was a leaning into. It was evolving. So, and we're all the same. We're all evolving. We're all growing and learning. And so I would like to, you to, we're going to ask Carrie to come up and make a little board report in a minute, a leadership council report. But as she's getting ready to do that, I would like to give you two minutes to just stand up and look in some direction and see someone you'd like to say hello to. Because we are one community. And there's people here that we still don't know each other. And as Reverend Linda said this morning, the picnic's going to be a great time to do more of that. But right now, I want you to just stand up and look and see right near you and grab that person and just take one minute and say, my name is, I'm here because, whatever. I'd like to get to know you. So we have two minutes. Go ahead.
moment. Let's come back to our seats. Say thanks to your new friend. So, so here comes our leadership council, president, chairwoman, all around great girl, Carrie Dolly. Good morning. It's so great to look out here and see all of you guys together. It's beautiful. Um, we do have just a couple of uh, changes that are taking place in the leadership council that I'd like to t uh, tell you about today. Bill and Debbie Gluth are going to be starting a new grand adventure. They've had the exciting opportunity to come up, and they are preparing to move to Arizona. So during the short time Bill was served with us, um, he was a voice of reason and wisdom. We loved having him, and we are going to miss him greatly. Um, we wish Bill and Debbie all the best as they move forward in their next new life adventure. And we will have Wendy Mayer now joining the Leadership Council in, Wendy's, in Bill's place. We're very excited about having Wendy with us. She brings with her great skills in leadership, community involvement, and previous board experience. She's an asset to us all, and we appreciate her enthusiasm and commitment to the Leadership Council as well as our community. So neither one of them were able to make it here today, but when you see them, please wish them well on their new, their new adventures. I also have one new exci another exciting announcement. Um, we are in the beginning process of creating the plan for candidating. Um, we are um, working on the beginning of the selection committee, and Celine and I will have more information for you guys next Sunday, so please um, start thinking about many of the things that you'd like to see in a, in a new minister as well as um, possibly being part of that selection committee. So thank you. thank you. I love visioning. And I have found that the easiest way for me to approach any topic that's really important is through that kind of visioning mindset, where you ask yourself, your inner self, not your chatter self, where you ask yourself, what's possible here? What wants to happen? What is the vision of possibility? What, what would life do unfettered by any of my limitating thoughts? What could life do here if I weren't in the way? And then I, um, you know, then I ask myself, well, to have that happen, what do I need to stop doing or stop thinking? Stop being, stop believing. What are the actions that don't serve me? And then, then I ask myself, what can I embrace? What can I do more of? And then I ask myself, where do I want to put my attention? Where do I, how do I want to proceed? And then I kind of go into communion and I ask life, Well, I'm listening. I'm listening. And what would you want me to know about this question I have? And then I listen. And I pay attention. And then the whole thing becomes easier than when I was making the pros and con lists and, you know, what, what would my father tell me to do or my son or my daughter or whatever. So I just remind you, you know, Reverend Lynn leads the visioning team here. Visioning is becoming deeper and deeper part of our practice. But it can become part of everything we do. It just becomes just like one of the ways that we look at life. And so when I do a talk, you know, that's, that's my visioning talk. So in the center there, that's my focus, my question. And on the bottom is the truth, what's true for me that I'm building my life upon. And on the top, it's what's possible. And over here, it's what must I release. And over here, it's what must I embrace. And so when I prepare to talk to you, I do the same thing. I think like that. Because it gets me out of my own little right and wrong mind. And it gets me to be 
I was going to say driven, maybe, guided, pulled by the thing itself instead of what I think I should be talking about. Because whenever I'm saying, what should I be doing, I know I'm out of it. I'm not in it. I'm not in that flow when I'm shooting. You know what I mean? I, I don't want to forget to honor. Um, you know, we talked last time about graduations and tra you know big life changes. And since I was last here and now here, um, we have a new practitioner in our midst. And I would just like to acknowledge Theral for passing his prac panels just a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, that's no small thing to do. No, it's, it takes a lot of soul searching and a lot of self-knowing and a lot of courage to face those parts of ourselves that don't work, that we need to release and to have the courage to lean into those parts of ourselves that we know to embrace, that we know will lift us up. So, so the truth is whatever you, whatever you have purpose and meaning and belief and, and conviction in today, that's your truth. There are great pillars of examples of truth, such as oneness such as love, such as harmony, such as kindness. Dalai Lama says, kindness is my religion. So th we have those examples. But what we must find is, what is it that we hold true? What has purpose and meaning for us? What really matters? What, what do I believe that that I'm willing to stake my future on? What am I believing now? And are they the same thing or are they divergent? What do I really know? No kidding, no fooling is the most important thing that spirit tells me is true. And are my feet moving in that direction? Or are they jogging around, you know, trying to get into the right position or look the right way or should this or should that? Or do I just stand there vulnerable and say, I have no idea how. I don't know what to do about all these other parts that aren't in alignment with this. But I know that this is my truth and this is what's calling me. And so somewhere in me, is the answer. And wisdom does not come from having all the answers and being able to eloquently state them. Wisdom comes from having the courage to ask the right questions, to look deeply into the heart of the matter without your should hat on. That's where you'll find wisdom. When you ask, what if it were true that we are one? What if I really believed that? Would I be acting this way? This is how to align our values and our actions together, is to notice who am I showing up as? And is it the person that I believe is the truth of me? Or am I stuck on something? You know, there's four siblings in my family. And we all have some similar characteristics. And we, that comes from how we were raised. Now we all have some differences because we're all different, really, beings. But underneath it all, we're all spirit. And we have so many differences. And before my father died, we were hardly talking to each other. And after he died, which was almost 20 years ago, we started exploring. Before my mother died, we hadn't been in the same room in 10 years. While my mother was preparing to leave, we were preparing to be a family. And we did it. 
We became a family. We used that moment for good. Not to blame each other for all the times we missed. Not to talk about how awful it was when we were doing that. We talked about what was really true. We're family. This is what matters. How can I support you? My sister is 12 years younger than me. I'm the oldest, she's the youngest. We're all control freaks. Well, we had to be. Your life was really something. And I was the oldest of this really something pile of puppies. <laughs> but through this whole process of being willing to be together in our grief, in our sorrow, the willingness to be in the, the fire of whatever it is, is where you find your metal. You'll find what you really believe if you let yourself. In the midst of the fire, you'll find it. And we did. And so now we can disagree. Now, but we don't, we don't get on each other's case anymore. We reach out. We may not even like some of the things we do. In fact, I hope they don't listen in. But there are some of us that don't <laughs> like some of those things that we do. But push comes to shove. We are there for each other in a way we never were in our whole growing up. Our whole growing up. We were doing this. Now, what are you doing here? <laughs> All right, well, there's an extra chair, so just have a seat. You want to take the microphone? Yep. Oh, my word. Well, you guys know that I come here pretty late sometimes. This morning, we were driving in, and there was a guy and his wife with six children walking down the street. And, and, I, and he had a cart. And the two of the littlest kids were in this cart because they were just little toddlers. And my wife says, I wonder where they're going. I says, I don't know. Well, when Reverend Barbara said we should sp sit up and get to know somebody, I turned to a person that was sitting next to me and he introduced himself. His name is Ty Cobb. He has a, a another, I guess it's his wife, named Hannah Reese. And they were sitting there. And I says, what do you do? And he says, well, I didn't quite catch what he said. But he's the guy that came here. And he's been coming here for several weeks now. And he gets on the tracks. And then he drags a cart with kids, with six little kids. And I'd like to have Ty and his wife stand up. Well, okay, so trusting spirit and throwing should to the wind, <laughs> hoping it doesn't hit any fans and it reflects back on me today. I get happy when I see Hannah and Ty, and I say so. I get happy when I see their children because those children are so well raised. This couple has found their way to us. And that is not an accident. Now, huh, I was raised on a farm, and we always took care of everybody. Everybody took care of everybody. In the in Soviet Union, in Ukraine, everybody takes care of everybody. That's community. They've adopted into us. They've chosen us. We're praying to find a house that will let them live there with their six children. Do you know that they've tried? We've found places that they can even afford, but because they're apartments, they can't live there. It's too many kids, too many people. I don't know how to do it, but this is God's call, thanks to Carl. 
that we stand with you. And, and so many of us have talked about this, that you have found your way to us because you are us. And whatever we do to you, we do to ourselves. Praise the good that is here in this family. I would love, they adopted in, I would like to adopt in too. I would like to be family with this family. I would like us to find out what is needed in their life because they've got a big road to hoe. And so if you care about that, talk to them and talk to me because I want our community to be in service to this community of eight people. And I want to find them a house. And I want to find them the support they need. And that is the spiritually right thing to do. And I wouldn't have done it today, but for you, Carl. Thank you. Thank you. So the third thing is, what do you believe in? And what are you walking towards? Well, you walk towards what you believed in. And I heard you. And so did we. And that's God in action. So to heck with everything else I was going to say. But this is as good as it gets. If we can, without feeling better or worse than anybody, be in community. So these six well-behaved, well-raised children have all the support they need. And what does that say about science of mind and the center of spiritual living? We're not rescuing anybody. We're responding to people that came and said, we're part of you, we. And so what I do for you, I do for me. And if I allow you to not have the resources that I know how to find, and I withhold those from you because I don't know how to do it well, then I'm withholding from myself. And that's the way it works always. So God bless all of us, no matter where we are in our spiritual journey. Are you with me? Oh. Oh. Well, the fan's not blowing yet. It's a good thing. Ah. Let's do the inner work. If there's practitioners who are not licensed yet, but you're intending to be a practitioner, join our practitioners. And we welcome Theral to our circle today. Whoa. We have ministers. You want to stand and pray with us? Please do that. Myrna? No. All right. All right, so let us know the truth together. Each of us has our own truth, but at one point, we all align in one thing. If it's true that we are connected to each other, if that is true, then we align in that truth that says no matter what happens to you, I feel it. No matter what I do to someone else, I do it to myself. If I seek to limit the flow of good to you, I staunch the flow of good to myself. If I open my heart to you, I open the heart to myself. If I open the heart to myself, I open my heart to you. It's easy, people. It's easy. We just have to act as if it's true that we're all connected and look into each other's eyes and, and go, oh my God, I forgot, I'm sorry, thank you. It's true. Who you are matters. What I know matters. Sharing who we are and what we know and what we have matters because that's how the world begins to work for everyone and eliminates the us and them and the haves and the have-nots. God bless us that we are here in this church that teaches these things. God bless us for the willingness to believe that it's true and to allow our actions 
to follow this truth, this principle that says we are one. There's only one thing happening, even if it's hard, it's God. And it's happening for me so that I might grow and open my heart more, that I might love more. So I give thanks. And if there's something that you want to shift in your life today, please see a practitioner. Tell him you're ready to let go of that old grievance or that sadness or that not enoughness. And look into their eyes and see the truth as they do the same as they look into yours. We are so blessed. Honest to God, we just need to stop standing in our way and look at each other. I am so grateful for this day, for this truth, and for this call to action that allows me to transform and invites us all to transform. And so through our tears, our joy is revealed. Thank you. Thank you, Spirit for showing up as each person in this room today who allowed us this moment of grace, of kindness, of compassion, of community. Thank you. We give thanks. We let it be so. We let it be our guide because it truly is. With all that we know, we say, and so it is. Amen.